from the our visiting speaker seminar series. And today, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Jeffrey Beverly. Uh, he's from Kentucky, and he grew up on uh, working his grandfather dairy farm. He has BSc in animal science from Kentucky University, and he completed master from Wisconsin. Then he did PhD at Purdue University, where he mainly focused on the application and economics of precision dairy farming technology. And for nine and a half years, he worked as a faculty at the University of Kentucky. And he also worked with the different companies, including Altec, and currently he's dairy analytics and innovation scientist with Holstein Association of USA. Jeffrey's professional interest includes precision dairy monitoring technologies, data record management, and analytics dairy cattle genetics and genomics. And today he will talk about the smart dairy, excitement with the caution, optimism. So then uh, hope, uh, he has numerous of publication and uh, so then uh, in an extension matter or peer review publication, and he's uh, really well known in the world of the dairy industry and it's a great pleasure to have him so then hopefully jeffrey just to kind of the covered a little bit about your background but in case if you have anything to add it would be great so then uh, with all in please go ahead and uh floor is yours okay great thanks for the invitation to come speak to your group today I'm excited to share with you our experiences with technology. I have been working in the technology arena for a, a long time now, and uh, I have some good experiences and some bad experiences that I want to kind of share both of those with you, uh, just to give a little bit of a realistic take of, of where we are in the area of dairy technologies. As was mentioned, I, I work for Holstein Association USA. And you see a logo there for the WKU Smart Holstein Lab. This is Holstein Association's combined effort with Western Kentucky University, where we study dairy technology. So we have over 30 different types of technologies <clears throat> there at the Smart Holstein Lab. You can see a cow there that has a lot of the devices on her from the Smart Holstein Lab. And if you're interested in technology, I encourage you to follow the Smart Holstein Lab on, on Facebook and Instagram, where we post a lot of information about dairy technology. So hopefully we pick up a few new followers from your group today on Facebook and Instagram, the Smart Holstein Lab. I consider myself to be a, a dairy data geek. I love dairy data, and you can see some pictures of me at various points of life, uh, from working with a baby calf and a kid, to working with what to many of you probably looks like quite an old fashioned computer there as a as a teenager. I started working with spreadsheets for our dairy farm back when I was about 10 or 11 years old. So I was working with spreadsheets when everybody else was playing video games, just to show you a little bit about how much I loved data. Of course, all cow spreadsheets. And then you can see a picture of me there. Uh, I'm equally comfortable behind the cow as I am behind the computer. And hopefully that provides me with a little bit of a, a unique take on dairy data and that I, I like the cow side of things just as well as I like the data side of, of things. And I've been working specifically in this dairy technology arena for about the last 18 years. and. I show this slide to, to show kind of how far we've come. So these are all pictures from some work that, that I've been involved with, and it's amazing how far we've come. So the picture on the top left there, that green tag, is a picture of one of the first accelerometer-based technologies for dairy cows. It was called an ice cube. And this accelerometer, the Fitbit for cow kind of an approach, measured number of steps and line time. And back then, whenever we wanted to get the data from that technology, we had to take that device off the cow. And when we took it off the cow, we would um, then have to um, use a toothpick to clear out the sand out of the 
uh, the port for that tag. And then once we got the sand cleared out of it, we would hook it up to a computer and it would take about two hours to download the data from one device. And of course, now we don't have to do that. All that data is transmitted wirelessly. In the middle picture on the top there, if you look, you see a picture of a raccoon because raccoons have been my nemesis in dairy technology work over the last 20 years. Um, raccoons are extremely talented at unplugging cables and moving cables and, and, and pulling out dongles and so forth. They're really a difficult challenge in dairy technology. And then on the upper right, you see a picture of a cow from above and you see these little green spots. Well, these are 23 points around the contour of the cow. This is the first work that we did on automated body condition scoring. So with this work, we basically had to click on 23 points around the contour of thousands of images to be able to get an, an indication of automatic body condition score. And of course, again, all that is done manually now. Sorry, done automatically now. And in the bottom left, you see a picture of a cow that's being walked past a coached past a panel reader. This was some work we were doing where we wanted to read room and temperature boluses, but we wanted to run them, read them very frequently. And at that point in time, in order for that data to download, the cow had to pass that panel. So we had to walk cow in circles around this. Uh, panel to be able to get the frequent reads of, of temperature. And again, of course, all that information is transmitted automatically today. So really, we've come a long way in dairy technologies in the last 18 years. When you think about all that occurs or that has occurred in the dairy industry over the last century, we've made some amazing progress scientifically in areas like animal nutrition, animal reproduction, animal genetics, et cetera, some of your base classes that you have in animal sciences. But I think that our next big scientific breakthrough is in analytics. It's how we use data in our dairy operations. Jeff, are you playing a movie because we don't have Voice. It's not coming through. OK, no problem. So that was just a, a video that showed sort of uh, what's happening in dairy technology with the use of technologies. And the reason I show that video is a, it's a very short video, but I just show it as an indication that this is mainstream. It's it's a video that comes up on um, sports TV. It's not something that shows up in my normal agricultural media um, because Everybody sees how much potential there is for dairy technology. And a lot of the companies that are investing in dairy technology are actually, that, co that commercial was from Dell, but there are other investments from companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple. This is, this is real and it's here and we see lots and lots of opportunities coming. I really like this, this slide as it shows a lot of the different companies that are involved in the dairy technology arena. And as you can see here, there are dozens of companies involved in dairy technology. Some of these companies, of course, you're very familiar with, companies like De Laval or Alltech or Elanco or Zoetis, but there's other companies that you've probably never heard of. In fact, there's companies here still that, that I've never really heard of. This is a relatively new slide. But the point here is that we've got a lot of players in this industry and a lot of really exciting, neat things coming to us on the dairy farm in terms of technologies. And there's a lot that we can learn from the rest of the world about how we use data. I'm a big basketball fan, so right now is an exciting time for me. And it's really interesting to watch how analytics or the use of data has changed the sports industry. So it's changed the way that basketball, football, soccer, hockey, every game has changed because of the use of data. And there's a whole lot of neat lessons that we can learn from that and bring that into the dairy industry. It's also important, though, that we recognize that the dairy industry was big data 
long before big data was cool. So we've been doing big data in the dairy industry for many, many years through things like genetic evaluations, ration balancing, the DHI system, all of that really is big data. So we've really been quite advanced in that. We're just taking it to a new level now. And we definitely have a road paid full of technology. So let's take a look at some of the different types of technologies that we have available to us or coming to us in the dairy industry. One of the areas, of course, that, that has changed a lot is the automated milking systems. So the use of, of robotic milking systems for the dairy industry, the box-based systems like you see in the upper right, of course, on the smaller dairies have done extremely well. And we'll see more and more, I think, of the either full or partial automation of milking on a, on a rotary or, or carousel system as we move forward, particularly for larger operations. The automatic calf feeding systems continue to advance and really have changed the way we think about feeding calves. When I was going through college, the idea that we could put calves in a group would have been something that we would have said, just, you just can't do that. But now we know we can manage this system when it's done right and it works extremely well for raising baby calves. We can automate, also automate processes on the farm. So here you can see an example of an automatic foot bath. This is the system that we're working with now at the Smart Holstein Lab. So this basically mixes and delivers the foot bath, counts the number of cows, and then empties out the foot bath in the right number of passes so that we can get our clean foot bath solution delivered to all of our cows all the time. Then we see a lot in terms of precision feeding. So uh, some movement back toward the idea of using the individual grain feeders. We can look at a lot of success occurring with these automatic feed pushers or feed breed mixers. And then even going as far as automating the entire TMR delivery process. So the, the whole uh, vector type system from Laley really changing the way we think about feeding cows. And in terms of, of uh, technology or software, one area that I think we probably don't talk about enough is the feed management software. In my mind, this is one of the most important pieces of of technology that we can have on our dairy farms. One of the things we should be looking at long before we look at some of those more novel indicators, but the feed management software systems like TMR Tractor, Easy Feed, Feedwatch, these are really, really great tools for managing what's the number one cost on our dairy farms. There are also systems now for doing real-time dry matter adjustment. So this system basically has and in our, our camera sitting in the feed bucket so that we get a real-time indication of the, the moisture level of our, our wet feeds, our silages and forages, so that we can do these adjustments real-time for managing the, the amount of dry matter going into our ration. There's some neat things now being done with drones. So this is an example of where a drone is being used to measure the amount of feed in a salad pile. So this is obviously a very irregular shape, but with a drone, we can actually measure the volume of the feed and get an indication of the amount of corn salad that we have in a salad pile. So really important for inventory management. Similarly, here's another simple technology. This device here sits on, on a feed bin, the leg of the feed bin, and it measures the amount of pressure there and it gives us an indication of the amount of feed in a feed bin and then puts that into a feedback loop back to the feed manufacturer so that we don't run out of feed. A lot of neat things coming in terms of manure management. This is basically like a, a Roomba type system for, for manure management to pick up manure. Really neat concept there. And extensive systems, particularly in countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, Ireland, where they do a lot more grazing. These virtual fencing systems are being used more now for rotational grazing. This is a, a really neat technology, particularly for those of us that, that deal with a lot of heat stress. Here in Kentucky, we deal with a lot of heat stress. 
And with this technology, basically, it's a soaker system that has a sensor on the, the feed line so that the soakers only come on one by one in the section where there's actually cows standing there. So if there are not cows in a particular part of that feed bunk, then the soakers won't come on in that part of the feed bunk. So it saves as much as 70% of the water being used and water being an extremely important resource for us. This is really a great sustainability story for the dairy industry. Not only that, but also we have less water that ends up in the feed alley, which provides a drier area for the cows to stand in, reducing risk for things like carry hillworms. Another piece of data that we probably don't talk enough about is the human resources data that we have. This is an automated time clock system, just simply knowing who's working when uh, to understand who's doing what in terms of who did the milking that day, who did the feeding that day, uh, so that we can take that information and tie it back into performance and use this information for coaching our employees. This is a really neat system from a company called NEDAP, a Dutch company, where it's basically an augmented reality system. The, the user wears these goggles, as you can see in the picture here, and then you can pull up the cow card and everything that you would want to know about the cow basically in the air. Another important area is monitoring the environment in which our cows live. So this system called Sonomasphere is measuring about 20 different air quality variables. So it sits in the barn and it measures, of course, temperature, humidity, but also important metrics like carbon dioxide, ammonia, and methane levels. Or we could use something like the Dairy Boss system. The Dairy Boss system, it has environmental monitors on, on each fan and controls each fan so that we can measure and manage the microenvironment. So a particular fan or soaker may be on by section of the barn so that we can really refine exactly what's happening within the, within the barn. So moving away from the idea that the fans are all the same for each, for the entire barn, that there's different environments within the barn. There's a company called ITK or Farmlife that's actually taking the idea of heat stress management to a different level, and they're creating a heat stress resilience score for each cow. But they're also managing and managing a um, an insurance system. So basically, an insurance program for heat stress. If the if heat stress is is more than what's anticipated for that region, then there's an opportunity for the farm to manage some of that risk. In the Netherlands, where ammonia emissions are an important issue, they've actually developed a cow toilet. And this cow toilet basically encourages the cow to release her urine in a specific area to help manage the ammonia emissions. Another area that I think is going to have a, a huge role in the future is hydroponic feed production. And this is more so in areas where it doesn't rain as much, but uh, they're saying that they can provide up to 20% of the animal dry matter needs through this hydroponic feed production system, really a neat way of raising feed. Or we could take a technology like the farm robotics company is, is doing here to manage injections. So this system is basically set up to automatically inject animals for vaccinations, hormones, et cetera, so we can really control that process. Now, the area that, that I've really spent most of my time working in is what we call precision dairy monitoring. Precision dairy monitoring is where we're managing and measuring variables with the individual cow. We might be monitoring something in the milk. We might be monitoring something behavioral. We might be monitoring something physiological, or we may be looking at something in the confirmation of the animal. And in general, what we're doing with precision dairy monitoring is we are using a management by exception approach. So you see we have some variable that we're measuring and we have some normal variation with that. 
And we're looking for these outliers. We're trying to find these points where we have an outlying event. The best example to use and think about here is, is heat detection or estrus detection, where we have activity moving along, and we're looking for that point where the activity increases beyond normal variation to tell us that it's time to breed that cow. And the estrus detection technologies are extremely mature. They're widely adopted in dairy industry, and that's relatively easily done. We also are using these kinds of technologies for mastitis detection, breast cow disease detection and lameness detection and calving detection. Another neat thing that comes from that is now we have all this new data that can be used to collect phenotypic data to use in genetic evaluations. Or we can aggregate this data at the group or herd level and use that for management monitoring. <clears throat> One of the neat things about these kinds of technologies is that we can perhaps detect disease better or sooner than what we could with visual observation because these technologies are monitoring the cows 24 hours a day. They're also measuring things that we might not pick up with our eyes. And if we can detect disease sooner, theoretically this helps us to improve our treatment outcomes. We can identify herd problems faster and we can be more proactive rather than reactive. And there are a lot of options out there in the industry now for these technologies. I kind of divide them into three different areas, the wearable technologies, the image-based technologies or machine vision technologies, and the milk analysis technologies. And the wearable technology industry is really just mimicking what's happening in human wearables. In many cases, we just borrow the idea from the human industry and bring it into the dairy industry. So the best example of that is the, the Fitbit for cow. That's exactly what we're doing with many of these technologies, many of these wearable technologies. It's actually a Fitbit for a cow. We are using the same base technology called an accelerometer to measure activity at various points on the cow. So we can put an accelerometer based device on the leg of the cow, the tail of the cow, the ear of the cow, or the neck of the cow and get a lot of valuable information from that. We can tell about how much time that cow spends eating, how many meals she takes, how much she's ruminating, how many steps she takes, how much she's lying down, and how many times she gets up and down from these kinds of devices. And this slide just shows some of the devices that we're currently working with at the Smart Holstein Lab, a number of different devices measuring activity in some fashion or another. Uh, we could also look at body temperature, rumination, eating time, lying time, and, and number of steps. <clears throat> when I first heard about this idea that we could use a device to measure something like rumination or eating behavior, I really thought this was science fiction. But you see here two, two videos that give us an indication of what's actually happening. On the left, you have an accelerometer, and it's just measuring the motion in, in three dimensions. That's what an accelerometer looks like. And then on the right, you see this cow that is ruminating. And what I want you to do is, is watch how consistent the ear movement is and the neck movement is in this cow as she's ruminating. That's why it's relatively easy to pick up these behaviors with an accelerometer-based technology. Now, just because it's easy or just because a lot of companies say they can do it doesn't mean that they all do it well. And I think that brings to mind the importance of third party validations for these kinds of technologies that we need some indication that they actually do what they say that they're doing. And we've done some validation work and I can tell you that there are some devices that are really, really great at measuring the behaviors that they indicate that they should be measuring. And then there are some that are not very good at all at measuring what they're supposed to be measuring. So. Uh, we need those third-party third party validations so we can actually tell which ones are doing what. And we get a lot of neat information from this. So this is a, a video from the company NeedApp where you can see they're tracking what percentage of cows are lying in each part of the day. And then also there's a, a map of the barn there to indicate where each cow is within the barn. So we get that from a, a real-time location system. But we have a whole 
lot of information about um, about the behavior of our cow. This is a, the real time location system beacon here. Basically, it's kind of a GPS for cows. Another thing is that these technologies can measure things we might not have thought about measuring before. But one of the areas that we've looked at is sleep. Does sleep matter for cows? Well, you see a picture here of two different people, one sleeping very comfortably on the right and one probably not as comfortable on the left. And the reason why I show you this is because we've worked a lot with compost bedded pack barns or, or loose housing systems. And one of the things that we observe in these loose housing systems is that cows really sleep a lot more in these systems than they do in, in freestall barns. So you can see here a video of a few cows that are truly in a deep REM sleep as they lay in these compost bedded pack barns. And this made us think about sleep. Is sleep important? You go back into the literature, not a lot of work done on sleep in dairy cows, but we've done a little bit more since, and we can use the, of course, complicated EEG, EKG equipment like you see in the, the top right here. That's obviously pretty invasive, but um, we could also use an accelerometer. So we developed an accelerometer based technology for measuring sleep behavior so that we can go into measuring rest quality, not just rest quantity. The next generation of wearable technologies is is probably this. So this is a, a startup company that is working on a technology. That is basically looking at interstitial fluid, so it works kind of like the the glucose monitors that you see people wearing and it's actually looking at physiologically what's going on in the cow. They're measuring progesterone, BUM, BHBA, and NEFA, and in addition to body temperature and activity. So they're looking at physiologically what's going on with that animal. Really a neat concept. This is a new technology, probably has some ways to go yet before it's actually doing the things that, that it proposes to do. But I think we'll see more of these kind of technologies as we move forward in our industry. One of the questions I get a lot of times is where is the best place to put a device honor in a cow. And I think the reality is there are pros and cons to every location. The ear is pretty easy to put the device on. It's a small size. However, sometimes the ear tag can easily be caught and torn out. The leg, it stays on the cow well. It's a bit harder to put on and sometimes the, those devices collect manure. Um, Leg tags were probably some of the first devices that are out there, but we're probably as an industry moving away from leg tags. One of the reasons is they don't provide the rumination and eating time, which has been proven to be very, very useful information for managing the cow. The neck stays on the cow very well. It's a great location for behavior. However, the biggest challenge with the neck tags is that that strap has to be adjusted as the cow grows. So we put that on a, a springing heifer, for example, and by the end of that first lactation, she's growing a lot. We probably need to adjust that tag. Or if we have neck growth that's associated with a cow gaining body condition, and the opposite, of course, is if we have a loss of body condition score, we may have to tighten that strap. The tail is a great location for calving behavior. However, we have to keep a balance of trying to keep that device on the cow without it falling off or putting it too tight on the cow, in which case we'll actually cut off blood flow and accidentally dot the tail. We want to avoid that, obviously. And then the reticulum rumen, reticulum and rumen are, are really two continuous parts of the cow. Uh, nice thing about that is there's no, a, no device on the outside of the cow. We can measure a lot of things simultaneously. The biggest downside to that is we can't reuse the device. Once it's in the cow, it's in the cow. We can use these devices to develop cow responsive environments. So now that we're measuring all these things, we can use the information about cow temperature or rumination or, or line time to determine when to turn the fans on based on what the cow is telling us as opposed to what the outside environment is telling us. 
Let's shift now to machine vision. I am really excited about the potential of what's coming in the area of machine vision. So we can use camera-based systems to measure things like body condition score and locomotion score. We can use this for monitoring calving behavior. We can use this for monitoring um, the surveillance of the animals. And then we can also use this kind of information to monitor the parlor. So this cow care system is monitoring milking procedure adherence. They can even identify aversive handling, really a neat system for helping to coach and evaluate the milkers themselves. Or we can use a camera-based system like the Canta system here, where they're monitoring cow behavior. They can look at things like lying behavior, drinking behavior, standing behavior, um, and then give us a time budget of the cows in the herd from machine vision, as opposed to having a, a device that's attached to every animal. This information can also be used to monitor the feed bunk, so we can measure the amount of feed before and after a feed delivery, measure how much feed is in each part of the bunk, and when cows are out of feed, etc. Sort of the next level of that is taking that to measuring actual dry matter intake using the camera system. So this is a, a system out of, out of Viking Genetics, a genetic company, where they're looking at, at individual animal feed intake using a camera-based system. The Laval has a body condition scoring system. So this system measures body condition score of every animal, every milking. Or we can use a device like this, the camera-based system to monitor movement of the legs as an indication of, of locomotion. So just monitoring the tracking of the legs, the comparison of the left feet to the right feet, and changes from day to day to identify when cows are becoming late. Another area that's very exciting to me is inline somatic cell count. There are a whole lot of systems that are coming out now for monitoring inline somatic cell count. So we can have a somatic cell count for every milking, for every cow, every day. Of course, while on one hand, that's very exciting. On the other hand, it brings to mind a lot of new questions about how do we manage that data? What do we do about cows that spike in somatic cell count for just a milking or two? And to make sure that we don't over treat animals. In many cases, if an animal does spike, for her somatic cell count just for a milking or two, and then she recovers back down to normal, well, probably that's what we wanted her body to do anyway, right? We wanted her to attack the infection and beat it. And in that case, the right action would be to not intervene. We've got some things to learn about how we manage that, but nevertheless, I think in terms of milk quality management, a very exciting development. Or we can go to this lab on a chip approach, so basically a small chip, where we're collecting a sample. In our case, we're usually collecting milk, and we can then take that to a chip to measure directly what's going on for a lot of different variables. So it's not just uh, it's not just somatic cell count, but perhaps we can measure progesterone, BHBA, uh, haptoglobin. There's all kinds of things that we can look at measuring, basically really understand biologically and physiologically what's going on with every cow in the herd because we are managing a laboratory where we're collecting samples from every cow two to three times a day. Another important area um, is monitoring equipment. So this is a system called the, the milk pulse system where it's monitoring the pulsation system. So we can monitor not just the health of, of the cows, but the health of the equipment and be proactive in managing our equipment. Here's another system that's looking at mastitis detection, basically measuring body temperature of, of the udder. Uh, another opportunity here for uh, managing mastitis detection. Here's another technology that, that I find really, really fascinating. This is from a company called GenoCells, and they're claiming that for a herd that's genomic tested, they can identify the somatic cell count of every cow in the herd from a bulk tank sample. So we wouldn't even have to be collecting samples from every cow. 
basically just from the, the genetic imprint of the, the somatic cells of um, each cow, we can identify individual cow somatic cell count. There's another system uh, that's taking somatic cell count measurement to the next level where they're dividing the somatic cells, the white blood cells, into uh, three different areas with macrophages, lymphocytes, and neutrophils so that we know at what point the animal is in dealing with the mastitis infection. Or being able to take PCR uh, detection on pathogen detection on the individual cow on farm so that we can identify what pathogen is causing that particular case of mastitis. Of course, we can also look at methane emissions and being able to uh, identify which animals are producing more or less methane so that we can use this information to select for animals that are more environmentally friendly. Another area of interest, of course, is the calf data, particularly with these um, automatic calf feeding systems. There's a whole lot of information that comes out of that that we can use to better manage the calves and to select for animals that are better performing calves. One of the areas that, that I'm very excited about is how we can use all of this data to develop new phenotypes. So we can measure new phenotypes related to mastitis. We have body condition score so that we can identify the trend in body condition score within a lactation to select for animals that don't lose as much body condition. We can measure things like estrus intensity from the estrus detection systems, fresh cow disease data, heat stress data, robotic milking selection, and the calf data. There's just a whole lot of potential for developing new genetic traits based on all this new data. I want to shift gears now and talk a little bit about perhaps some of the uh, not so great stories about technologies. And there's a lot that we can learn from those companies and technologies that didn't make it. We have a large technology graveyard now, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from that. And I've been fortunately or unfortunately involved in the graveyard of a number of different technologies now. One of the challenges that we have is, is just physical form problems. So you can see here some devices that are attached to the cow that have a physical form problem. This device was a rather large system that sat on the cow's rump. It had eight D-sized batteries in it, so it was very heavy. And it attached to the cow's tail and was really large and cumbersome. And it caught on things. It just wasn't conducive to being on a cow in a barn. <clears throat> and it, it didn't stay on the cow. And not only that, but it also really aggravated the cow. And when we used this system, we actually saw reduction in, in things like lying behavior and, and eating behavior because the cows were, were aggravated by this large device sitting on their rump. Another challenge is, is where systems just have too much infrastructure. There's too much cabling needed, too much to manage to add the system to our, our operations. Another challenge that we have is, is where we have the new name, but it's the same idea. At this point in time, we don't need more accelerometers for cows. There are lots of them out there. They work well when they're when they're built right, um, but there's a lot more. Uh, there's not a lot more need for an additional accelerometer based tag. We have some really great ones that are very mature in our industry already. Touched already a little bit on on rodents and and farm realities. Some of the challenges that we have are just related to the environment that we're working in. And one of those things is, is lightning. Lightning will strike the same technology multiple times and that knocks your system out. It's really a problem. What's the backup plan for when that technology goes out for a few days? Another thing that, that I had a lesson with recently was in working with a couple of different technologies at the Smart Holstein Lab where we were struggling to get them to connect to the to the internet and many emails back and forth and calls trying to do things to to get this system online two systems actually 
and we couldn't get them online. So finally, one of the guys from the manufacturer decided to come do a site visit, and we had the university IT people there, and we were sitting there together, and the the uh, technology manufacturer, he said, okay, so I'm getting ready to type this username in and this password in. And the university IT guy went very blank, and he said, oh my gosh, I gave you the wrong password. So for two months, we couldn't get into the system for a simple reason of having the wrong password. So the important thing there is that that sometimes the simple things are what we should be looking for first. Another real challenge that we have in our industry is that rural connectivity is still a problem. In many parts of the world, it's a challenge to get a cell phone signal or a Wi-Fi signal on our farms. And the assumption is if you live in a city that, that everybody has great internet all the time, and that's just simply not the case in rural areas all around the world at this point. Another challenge is that companies often miscommunicate where they are in the development stage. They overpromise and they underdeliver. They they say they're here. What they really mean is this is our goal for where we want to be five years from now or 10 years from now. And that creates a lot of mistrust among dairy farmers with these technologies. Another challenge that we see is, is where the, the focus is on the technology rather than the information coming from that technology. It's the information that's important, not the technology that itself. Yes, it's cool that we can measure this or interesting that we can measure this, but if it doesn't provide us with valuable information that can change things on farm, then it's fairly useless. And some data, no matter what we do, is just interesting, but not useful. And we have to remember, just because we can collect something doesn't mean that we should collect it. Another important factor is the economics of these technologies. Some systems are just too costly to really justify the investment. If a technology costs three or four thousand dollars per cow to invest in it, then it's more expensive than the actual cow itself. We don't need to run any kind of economic model to, to assess that. But in many cases, just the costs are just too much for making these technologies make sense. And with technologies that are focused on disease detection, sometimes I think we get a little too focused on disease detection and not thinking enough about disease prevention. Prevention is always more uh, effective than, than treatment. And with these technologies, I think we can get into the trap of just getting focused on detection, detection, detection. So if I'm a herd that has a 70% lameness incidence, I probably don't need a lameness detection technology. I need to fix the reason why my cows are becoming so lame. I talked about this earlier, but we really need these third party validations. And this is one of the reasons why I think we need them. This is a study that we did where we had multiple devices on the same cows. You can see here, three different devices measuring rumination time. And on average, there was over 100 minutes a day difference in rumination time. Four different technologies measuring line time. On average, there was over three hours a day difference in line time. And three different technologies measuring number of steps. On average, over 2,000 steps a day difference. Which of these technologies is right? Which of them are wrong? I have some ideas because uh, we did do some validation studies on this, but clearly they're not all measuring the same thing. Some of them are maybe not measuring it very effectively. Perhaps it's more important that we look at the consistency of the technology from day to day. And one of the most important things that we can take home from this slide is that we cannot effectively compare some of these behaviors across farms if they're using different technologies. So look at the rumination times, for example. We could say that one herd was doing a lot better in rumination time or indicating better rumen health than another herd, when in actuality, it's just because they had a different tag on. Another important lesson is, is how good are we at finding our events of interest? And so this comes down to type one and type two errors. 
those of you that are graduate students are all familiar with this, but our false positives and our false negatives. Um, it's really easy for us to take and show us show graphs like you see on the left here, where we have cows with or without subclinical ketosis. And here we're looking at the fat protein ratio. We show that cows that have subclinical ketosis had significantly higher fat protein ratios than those that didn't. And it's statistically significant on all these days. But the reality is this is the important question. The important question comes, how do we use this information for detecting disease? And you can see we had seven different systems on these cows where we were looking at subclinical ketosis and our detection rates were not that great and our false positive rates were, were also very high. So the balance between sensitivity and specificity wasn't really what we wanted it to be. And this has to do a lot with how well farmers accept these systems. You can see here in this particular study, we looked at, at three different farms with over 1,200 cows. And we followed up and asked what the farms were doing with the alerts. And we found out they were actually only looking at one third of the alerts from the, uh, the cows in this study. Another challenge is, is what I call a data dump, where there's just a bunch of information that's dropped in the farmer's lap and the farmer's left to do, left to determine what do I do with that information. The software interface or user interface is, is extremely important. Uh, what do I want to see in a software interface? I want to see a cloud-based interface, a smartphone application, an interface that addresses the need of both visual and verbal learners. Some of us prefer to see graphs while others prefer to see tables. We need to have something that addresses both needs. An intuitive user interface, interconnectivity with herd management software, a real-time data display. I don't want to be looking at data from a week ago. I want to be looking at today's data. Indicators of what's most important and actionable. I don't want to look at graphs for every single cow every day. I want to be able to be alerted to which animals are the ones that really need attention. And then I need customer focus training and support. The, the customer service in these technologies is extremely important for their adoption. And this is an example of, of what I think is a really nice user interface, very easy to work through and intuitive as we look at that to, to figure out how to find the information that we're looking for. Another challenge that we have in dairy technology is that we have a lot of information sitting in silos. So we have information coming from, from DHI, from sensors, from genetics, and milk buyers, nutritional information, financial information, and not much of this information does a very good job talking to each other. And that's limiting what we can do with that technology. Luckily, there are a number of different companies that are working as data integrators. A lot of these are startup companies that are, that are trying to come up with platforms for helping to integrate data more effectively across systems. Now, I should say this isn't a technical issue. It's very easy to take data and merge by cow by day um, in, in a, an overall database system. However, what we do have is an issue of uh, proprietary and competitive challenges. So one company may not want their data to sit in the same platform with another company's data. So it'll never be a utopian world where we have a one size fits all type of an integration system for all the data that's on our dairy farms. Now, some people say that this is only a big data issue, but I think that that big data and small farms actually work well together. Uh, too often, small farms fall into the trap of saying that only applies to the big guys, doesn't apply to me. But the reality is that biology and business management principles are not size dependent. They're, they're the same whether we're a small farm milking 10 cows or a large farm making milking 10,000 cows. We also need to consider the economics of these technologies. In looking at the economics, we need to consider what's the initial investment in the technology, what are our ongoing or variable costs associated with the technology. We need to recognize that we're only reducing, not eliminating the case cost of a disease. We need to compare the detection cost versus prevention cost. Maybe we're better off than spending our money in prevention. Consider the cost of the intervention that we have to make if we do detect a disease. And then consider whether or not that, that 
intervention is successful, it's not always going to be successful. And perhaps most importantly, do we actually use the information coming from the system or do we ignore it? Some of the overall lessons that we've learned, we've learned we need to be careful with these early stage technologies. Yes, they're exciting. Yes, they're innovative. But you're going to have more trouble, more challenges when you're the second system that's out there versus the 102nd system that's out there. We need to be prepared for little things to go wrong. It does take a few months to learn how to use the data. It's not a matter of turning these systems on and automatically changes the way we manage and data integration is, is very challenging. All that being said, I think it's important to remember that perfection is the enemy of progress. In many cases, although we may not be perfect with what we're doing with some of these technologies, it's a dramatic improvement from what we've been able to do before. I think tomorrow's technological innovations are beyond what we can imagine and that we should dream big. Other industries are going to introduce technologies that open new doors. So there's going to be something that comes in the automobile industry or in the entertainment industry or whatever, that we're able to take that idea and bring it into the dairy industry. We'll see a shift in focus from reproduction and health to more animal well-being and environmental sustainability. We'll have better options for data integration. We'll focus more on decision support. So how do we use the data? not just here's the data and we'll get to the point where the machine learning algorithms are more important than the technology itself we'll see more data driven dairies in the future data driven dairy producers understand basic statistics they manage with economically important kpis they look forward not just backward they connect production to finance and they treat data as an asset that's why i ask every dairy farmer, who's their chief information officer? Who is in charge of managing the data on their dairy? In many cases on larger operations, I think the CIO will be an actual position. So a large dairy will have somebody, their whole job is to look at the data and, and mine the data and find opportunities within the data. On smaller operations, maybe that's somebody that that's 20% of their time or 40% of their time that the CIO is going to be an important part of the dairy moving forward. And with all that being said, we never need to lose sight of the cow. Um, the cow is the center of what we do, and we need to keep in the biology and common sense factors related to the, the beautiful cows that we get to work with. There's my contact information. Uh, feel free if you have any questions to reach out to me in the future, any questions about technologies and as I mentioned check out the smart hosting lab uh, we have a lot of neat things going on there and I think we probably have a couple minutes left for some questions yep thank you so much Jeff for, for a great presentation I like the way that you summarized the all the companies actually and the majority of them and talked about some sort of the problem that they are facing with the dairy industry and we do have time for question in case if you have question just uh you can turn on your camera and unmute yourself and ask question or if you would like you can just write down in the chat and uh, we can ask on your behalf yes Joan, go ahead i'd like to start uh thank you jeff i've been looking forward to this uh, presentation obviously I'm super excited to have you and I think you know some things we knew and other things were um, aha moments for me so one thing given your experience with the university and industry and startups and dairy farms what's what's the role of the university what do you see our our space being where we can add value to this big opportunity that's coming down the pipe well one of the areas I think is in third party validation so a university is, is, is an, an independent entity that can help a lot with third party validations, um, helping to understand the, the true biological and, and physiological implications of what's being measured is important. Um, and then I, I don't know in, in Canada, but in, in the US, the university is very closely tied to extension and outreach. So being able to, um, to help provide some independent messaging and training to dairy producers. So 
when you look at how many different technologies are out there, it's important. And that's one of the reasons why hosting association is involved in this too, to help help dairy producers try to understand the complexity of what's out there and, and the pros and cons of different things. And and as opposed to somebody that's just trying to market a particular technology to help help sort through some of that. That being that's said, I've, I've sat on this this from different angles now. Um, you know, being in university and, and being involved with technologies from from the development to a very mature technologies <clears throat> and universities can't move fast enough sometimes for this. So there's a there's a very important need for the industry involvement in this because industry can innovate and move so much more fast than than what a university can. So um, there's a need for both both angles. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. One thing I will say too, I would I would caution against um, one of the temptations is is in the university to um, just repeat things that people have already done. And so last summer I went to the, the precision livestock farming meeting in in Europe, and I was amazed at how many universities put, had different graduate students up there presenting work, which was basically saying we can attach an accelerometer to a cow and measure rumination behavior. And so it was just the same thing that we've been doing now for for 10 or 15 years. And it was just repeating something that's already been done. And I think because sometimes if, if you're at a university and you're applying for a local grant or maybe a grant that doesn't have uh, people familiar with the industry, they, they'll fund it just because it fit fits for cow sounds neat. But um, it's just repeating what's already been done over and over and over again. We know we can do that. Yeah, yeah I agree. And the other point that Jeff, maybe you agree with me, just that in a university, we need to prepare kind of the revise our curriculum and prepare students for the coming technology. That's something that we need to work on that part. We do have Julian, so please uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, I have a question. With all this data and technology, do you think we get a good understanding on the welfare of an animal? Do you think we could substitute uh, pro-action with all this data and technology? I do think there's some potential for that because they they can provide more objective measures. So say, take something like an automatic body condition scoring system or an automatic locomotion scoring system that it can remove some of the subjectivity of that, provide continuous monitoring. All that being said, um, we do need to keep in mind that uh, one of the important pieces we haven't touched on is, is data security. And so if I'm, a, if I'm a dairy producer and I have a system now that's measuring locomotion or body condition, I really have to be very protective of that data because I don't want to get it, to, I don't want it to get into the wrong hands. Um, and so there's the data security piece, but then there's also the, the data ownership piece of who owns that data and who could access that data. And that's a very complex issue. Um, a lot of times people say, well, the farmer owns the data. And I, I love that conceptually, that the farmer owns the data and, and that sits with my ethic. But in many cases, the reality is the farmers actually signed the data away already. It's, it's not unlike, I'm sure all of you sitting there have a smartphone. Um, and if you have a smartphone, what do you do when you want to download an app? You go and you, everybody reads that end user license agreement word by word, right? I don't, I don't read them. I just scroll to the end and I say accept. And in the meantime, when I've done that, I've signed away the rights for my data. And farmers do the same things a lot of times without thinking about that they, they get a 10 page document and none of us, none of us are lawyers. We read that, we don't read that 10 page document, but in reality, we've signed away the rights of the data sometimes. Yeah. And also I would like to add, Jeff, like the, the point is all of these tools that we are developing are to improve production and animal welfare. So that these are, we are going to have more and more tools to improve the animal welfare and technology using to, to improve the productivity and the 
uh, financial returns. A any other question? Yes, go ahead for the last question that we can just take. Yes, please. Um, will new technology have a major impact on animal mm -hmm. welfare? I think it has potential to improve animal welfare significantly. So um, if we take technologies that reduce the amount of disease and lameness, for example, or that that can measure behaviors to help us better understand how to improve cow comfort, then I think that they have a huge impact on positive impact on animal welfare. Um, not everybody thinks that and maybe there's some times where they don't. So, for example, some people are concerned that it removes the farmer away from looking at the cows. I think it makes the farmer more in touch with what's happening with the cows. And the reality is that if you have a technology and you don't understand cows, then it's not going to work. You have to understand cows and you have to understand what the technology is telling you. For example, uh, with the heat detection technologies, one of my friends, he says sometimes he sees this guy, it's a leg tag and he sees a cow and he thinks that cow shouldn't be in heat. She doesn't look like she's in heat. And he looks closer and he finds out he actually has a hairy hill wart. And the reason why she's got a heat alert is because she's stomping her foot. And the stomp of a foot looks the same to a, a technology as a cow that's that's in heat. Um, because it's really just measuring the, the leg activity. And so that's where you, you got to throw some common sense on top of this. And so in my mind, I think that these technologies actually increase the need for people that have good cow sense. They don't decrease it. You have to have people that, that can interpret that information correctly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much Joe, for the answering. So then because of the matter of the times, I would like to conclude the, the session. And Jeff, really appreciate your time and this great presentation. And thank you so much everyone for attending today's seminar. And a special thanks for Julian and Rem, my, 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 my teammates in the organizing these speaker seminar series. Uh, that's all and, uh, and take care everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, take care. Good day. Jeff, I will get in touch with you later on for, for to talk about more of these technology stuff. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.